This film is sponsored by New York Life and its dedicated agents, proud sponsors of NFL Team Highlight Films. New York Life, the company you keep. On January 17, 1993, Don Shula's Dolphins were where they wanted to be, competing for the AFC Championship and a right to play in Super Bowl XXVII. As they had all season, the Dolphins displayed a flair for the spectacular. The Dolphins were playing for more than points. They were playing to prove their point that Miami is once again one of the NFL's elite teams. Truth be told, it was a frustrating afternoon. What could have been the day of the Dolphin instead became a day of near misses. It's a champion's torment to come so near a goal only to have it fall through your fingers. But the Dolphins will be back, make no mistake. The 1992 season was a harbinger of bright days ahead because the Dolphins are a team of togetherness, tenacity, and talent. Drive a nail into the coffin right here. Marino, play fix, bootleg rolls to his right, throwing deep upfield, man down there, touchdown to Mark Cooper. Mark Higgs is on the cusp of greatness. Rookie Marco Coleman proved to be an impact player and helped ease the load of Jeff Cross. Troy Vincent was another rookie with potential who consistently made the plays, while Brian Cox remains a punishing All-Pro. Holy Toledo, what performance and intensity. The 1992 Dolphins flew to the ball and flew through the air in a season of unqualified success. A season which saw them win the AFC East. And best of all, a season which makes it clear the Dolphins are only one step away. The 92 Dolphins traveled to Cleveland for their season opener, where Dan Marino and the offense cruised in the fast lane. Mark Higgs' seven-yard scamper gave Miami a 14-point lead, but with under two minutes to play, a would-be Monday night mauling became an early season test. Mark Bavaro paid the price for giving the Browns the lead, but with 75 seconds to play, Dan Marino made sure it didn't last. Four consecutive completions had the Dolphins poised for a win. A determined Mark Higgs did the rest. The following week, the Dolphins returned to Joe Robbie for the home opener. Outside, fans were already singing the team's praises. Inside, the Dolphins danced all over the Rams. Everybody set in tight up front. Here's Marino, bootlegs, rolls to his right, throws the end zone wide open for the touchdown is Farrell Edmonds. Back on the baseline of the end zone. Backs are split, Marino straight back drop in the pocket, looks, throws deep to the near side down there. It is caught for a touchdown by Mark Duper. Super Duper. Two first quarter touchdown passes were all the points Miami would need as the defense simply fleeced the Rams. Receiver spread to either side, he will throw it. Back in the end zone, he's being rushed, and then they sack him. The ball is fumbled. What a rush. Brian Cox almost saw Jimmy Everett in half. Brian Cox's two sacks were the perfect complement to the Dolphins' 2-0 start. A week later against the Seahawks, Cox again led the defensive charge against enemy signal callers. Back he goes to throw, pressure on him in the pocket, pumps once, he's going to have to eat it from behind. The ball is stolen away, and the Dolphins have come up with it. David Griggs took the ball right out of the hands of Stauffer, the quarterback. We've got to have that 14 and 15 now. We need runs. We've got to have the group. Knock him off the ball when we got a shot at it. Stay in our face. Come on, let's go. The Dolphins heard and heeded. 
The defense's heads-up play was bettered only by a headstrong Dan Marino. Who, despite a concussion, knew what to do. Still, it was Scott Mitchell's first career pass which gave the Dolphins a first down and set the stage for Dan Marino. Trailing by five points with just over two minutes remaining, Marino delivered. He throws for the corner of the end zone. Man down there. It is. Touchdown. Touchdown. Woo! Going to Fred. Money in the banks. Three consecutive wins, including two fourth quarter comebacks on the road, was cause for celebration and concern for the rest of the AFC East. By the time the Dolphins arrived at Rich Stadium, it was clear how big a splash the Dolphins' early season exploits had made. All the attention you get when you're undefeated. Big, big, prime time. Time to get busy. Here go what we see, what we made of, baby. Let's go, let's go. Let's go. Don't be a dog fight out there. Don't be a dog fight. All over him. Look him in the eye, challenge him, but make it happen. Let's go. Let's go. Miami made it happen all day long, and it was the newest Dolphin who made it happen first. Newly acquired tight end Keith Jackson's all-out effort was a harbinger of things to come. Jackson wasn't the only receiver to put a spin on things. The Bills were befuddled and kept off balance as Dan Marino distributed the ball to seven different receivers. And while the offense was scoring points at a breakneck pace, the defense was committed to breaking Buffalo's back. Let's go, Jimbo. We need six. Let's do it. Come on. Let's go offense. By day's end, the Dolphins had forced five turnovers. But it was a force of one named Lewis Oliver who stole the show by punctuating punishing hits with three picks. Oliver's record-tying 103-yard return capped a 37-10 Miami route, and best of all, had the Dolphins alone atop the AFC East. We ride them, Buffalo! All the way back to Miami! We own Buffalo back! We own that back! Yeah! The Dolphins were riding herd and riding high as they returned home to face the Falcons. Having never lost to an NFC team at Joe Robbie was good incentive to win, Mark Higgs proved a potent place to start. The far side of the field, here's the snap. Give off to Higgs, wide open hole. The 10, 5, touchdown Miami. Beautiful gaping hole over the right side. Two Falcon touchdown passes erased the Dolphin lead. The defense would not surrender a third. Miller back to throw. He fires, intercepted. This is gonna go for a touchdown by Vesty Jackson. Vesty Jackson makes the big play the Dolphins needed, took it away from Mike Pritchard. He gambled, and he won. Vesty Jackson's timely interception return cut the deficit to three points and started the comeback. And as the fourth quarter began, it was time for Dan Marino to finish it. In a total team effort, 
Tony Martin got Miami close. Then Tony Page paved the way for Higgs' score. There's a give off to Higgs outside of the right, cuts for the end zone. He's got a touchdown. Yet another come from behind win kept the Dolphins undefeated and undaunted. A week later, they simply pulverized the Patriots. And while the Pats could manage only 18 yards on the ground, Miami moved the ball at will. Hugs for Higgs were only appropriate. Dan Marino, on the other hand, was untouchable. Fires deep, man open, Clayton, 10, 5, touchdown, Dolphin! As he tied an NFL record with his 17th game of four touchdown passes. In the end zone, caught touchdown to Keith Jackson. 11-yard line, first down, Marino back to throw, in the pocket, pumps once, loops for the end zone, caught! by Jackson for a touchdown. At 6 and 0, oh, the signs were unmistakable. The Dolphins were a superb football team. There was every reason to believe win number 7 would come quickly. Instead, everything went wrong. Uncharacteristic mistakes cost Miami the game. The next week against the Jets, the mid-season melees continued. Losing to a superior team is hardly pleasant, but the Dolphins were hardly the inferior team. And they were determined to prove it when they traveled to Indianapolis to face the Colts. Evidence of the Dolphins' superiority was as ample as it was incontrovertible. Here's the snap on the shotgun, back is George. In the pocket, under pressure, now moves to his right. He's gonna run with the ball, this consumes time. And he's the fumbles the ball, and the Dolphins come up with it at the 39-yard line. The defense punished the Ponies, recording four turnovers en route to their first shutout in six seasons. The Dolphins' offense was as explosive as the defense was stout. Over 200 yards rushing, 107 by Higgs, was more than enough to overwhelm the Colts. Baxson and I, Higgs is the tailback. Marino gives to Higgy over the right side. He strips a tackle. He's in the end zone for the score. Running over people, cut back to his left at the one and lunged into Pater. It seemed the Dolphins had regrouped just in time for a Monday night showdown against the Bills. The stakes were high, first place in the division, and so was the hype as the Dolphins celebrated the 20th anniversary of the legendary 1972 undefeated squad. Early on, the 1992 team looked every bit the equal of their unparalleled peers and ready to reclaim the top spot in the division as Dan Marino completed his first 11 passes. Marino from the gun. Here's the snap. Back he goes to throw. They're after him on the blitz. He moves to his left, throwing deep. Got a man down there. It is caught. Down at the 20, 15, down to the 10. Inside the 10 goes Mark Cooper. Greg Beatty goes in motion. Here is the play fake pass to Beatty. Touchdown. The man in motion. Post pattern right underneath the crossbar. It's been mostly all Dolphins in this first half. Clayton in motion to the near side. Marino drops to throw. He looks under pressure. He fires in the end zone. Man down there. Touchdown. The it wasn't the enough. As a valiant effort became just another loss. But if anyone was concerned that the season was about to take an about face, they needn't have. Because the following week, Dan Marino stared down the specter of defeat by opening the offense up. The snap back, he goes to throw, in the pocket. He will loft it downfield, man down there, it is caught by Freddie Banks. With the score tied, the Dolphins were concerned, but not cornered. As Marino took stock of the situation, then took control in a sublime example of leadership. Marino deftly guided the Dolphins into field goal range. This will be a 52-yard attempt. Scott Mitchell to hold. 
If he makes it, the Dolphins win. If he doesn't, we go into OT. Here is the snap. Good snap. Set down. Kick is on its way. He's got the distance on it. It's gone. The Dolphins have won the ball game, 19 to 16. Although there's two. Seconds Pete Stoyanovich's clutch kick gave the Dolphins their eighth win in high drama. The next two weeks would prove the low point of the season. Consecutive losses to the Saints and 49ers could have ended the Dolphin season. A lesser team may have lost heart after the lapse. But the 1992 Dolphins were more than just talented. They were determined. And in week 15, the Dolphins found just the ticket to turn the tide of the season. Don Shula set the course. Miami's defense set the tone. The Dolphins dismantled the silver and blacks attack with a frenzy of ferocity. Limiting the Raiders to a paltry 150 yards of offense was only half the story, as J.B. Brown added insult to injury. Three to nothing. Kim Brown in motion. Play fake by Schrader. Back he goes to throw. Goes for the sideline. Intercepted by Brown. He's going to score. Out of the 10-5. Touchdown, Miami. On offense, the big play returned, and the Dolphins never looked back. Backs are split. Here's a flea flicker coming up. Marino juggles the ball around. Got a man downfield. Duper. He's got it. Touchdown. Flea flicker touchdown. Miami's 20 to 7 victory did more than snap the Raiders' winning streak in Miami. It brought the Dolphins a step closer to the playoffs and served notice that the Dolphins were back. A week later against the Jets, the Dolphins were again the focus of prime time. The intensity at Joe Robbie was palpable. If you step on the field, it's going to get hit tonight. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, let's get this thing started. Here's the, start. the stakes were clear. A win meant a playoff berth. A loss? Well, the game plan didn't include such a contingency. Fourth and two. Marino, long count at the line of scrimmage. Back he goes, looks, fires across the middle, caught for a first down. And it's going to go for a touchdown as he broke away from the tackler. Excellent play by Mark Clayton. Mark Clayton's catch and run gave the Dolphins an early lead. The Dolphins' defense gave the Jets a headache. But while the hitting was liberal, so too was the Jets' play calling. And as the fourth quarter started, the Dolphins were looking at the short end of a 17-10 score. The Dolphins were down, but not daunted. It's on the third sound. Yeah. When I go five man, you know, or if I go five man, 86, it changes the second. On fourth and two, the Dolphins declined to play it safe. Play of the game, perhaps, for Miami. Here it is. Back he goes. Fires across the middle. It is caught. 50, 45, 40. Foot race. It's going to be won by the Dolphins. 10, 5. Touchdown for Tony Martin. And there are no flags. What a great Tony call. Martin's spectacular play could have tied the score. But a missed extra point kept the Dolphins down by a point. But Miami kept the faith. With just over a minute to play, Dan Marino began yet another fourth quarter comeback drive, his fifth of the year and the most critical. With seconds to play, a single point separated the Dolphins from the playoffs.
one can only wonder about the demon circling around in Pete Stojanovic's head. Stojanovic, Mitchell awaits the snap. Here it is, good snap, set down. Kick is on its way. He it is it. gone! What a win for this football team. Pete Stojanovic's clutch kick capped the most dramatic comeback of the year. But more importantly, it gave everyone reason to believe there would be another game at Joe Robbie. The Dolphins were playoff bound and had a chance at their first division title since 1985. In the regular season finale in Foxborough, the Dolphins continued their incredible march toward a division title. Despite sub-freezing temperatures, the Dolphins sweated for more than 57 minutes before tying the score and sending the game to overtime. It was there that Pete Stojanovic was again called on to decide matters. Don Shula's 300th regular season win was sweet. Sweeter still, the Dolphins were AFC East champs. Indeed, the Dolphins were going forward full tilt. And although the South Florida sun had yielded to rain, only the charges would get soaked on this day. Whether they were inspired by the crowd or something from within, the Dolphin defense played their game of the year. He floats a long pass. It is knocked away out of the hands. Troy Vincent's transformation from raw rookie to polished playoff performer was a microcosmic representation of the team. Grace under pressure, pride in performance. Humphrey straight back drop in the pocket, fires deep across the middle, intercepted by Vincent. Of course, games only turn on turnovers if an offense can convert them into points. Don Shula was determined to waste no opportunity. Now let's see what they come up with now. Here's the play fake. Marino swings a pass, caught by Page for a touchdown. Miami's defense was as relentless as the rain and not satisfied with only one turnover. Here's Humphrey back to throw. In the pocket, has all day, fires it. It is off the hands and intercepted by the Dolphins. Vincent's second interception was quickly followed by the Dolphins' second score. Dolphins smelling touchdown again. Marino quick grab. Page deeper throws for the corner of the end zone. Keith Jackson touchdown. Opportunistic proved to be the theme of the day because on their next possession, Brian Cox showed why he is an all pro. All right, first down Chargers with 102 and one timeout left to go in the half. Humphreys rolls back to his right. It appeared Fires to be a game of one upsmanship between the Dolphins' defense and offense. Except for the ball game on young Mr. Stan Humphreys. Loads of time to score again for Miami. Snap to Dan, back he goes to throw. In the pocket, deep up the middle. Man down there, Jackson, touchdown! The Dolphins were making it look easy. No mean feat in a playoff game. But they were taking nothing for granted. They probably could have played forever because Miami was having fun and simply running away from the charges. Traver hole on the outside, turns the corner, eludes the tackler to 20, 15, 10, down to the five, he scores! Indeed, what a run and what a season. A year after missing the playoffs, the Dolphins had 12 wins, a division title, and come within an ace of the Super Bowl. In a season of extraordinary achievements, the Miami Dolphins rediscovered their winning tradition and earned the right to be called champions. Hi, I'm Steve Sable. As you've just seen, the 1992 Dolphins had a remarkable season. But as good as the Dolphins were, there there's still some questions, like which is the real team? The one which won its first six games or the one which lost five out of seven? Well, 1993 will definitely be a telling season for the Dolphins. First of all, they've got to be consistent, something they weren't last season. On the positive side, 
Their defense is no longer the team's weak sister. Rookies Marco Coleman and Troy Vincent both played well in 92 and looked like they, they might have all pro potential. And Brian Cox not only gives them a legitimate pass rush, but on-field toughness as well. Still, Miami means Marino. And the Dolphins have made some key acquisitions to make his job a little easier. Tackle Ron Heller and receivers Irving Fryer and Mark Ingram suggest that the Dolphins are determined to surround Marino with the necessary talent to take the next step. When assessing the Miami Dolphins' prospects, it's tempting to focus on Dan Marino. After all, as Marino goes, so goes Miami. But if you're going after a trip to the Super Bowl in the AFC, you've got to get past the Bills. They're still definitely the team to beat. They, they've been in the Super Bowl, but you can see everybody else improving, and, and I hope that they can say that about the Dolphins, too. we got to improve. The Dolphins have improved. Last season, they claimed their first division title in seven years. And while the rest of the division may be chasing the Bills, the Dolphins have a lead and a leader. But I still like the Miami Dolphins, and um, the one constant there has been Dan Marino. And here's a guy that's just, he's got that fire. He's also got more weapons at his disposal than he's had in a long time. And perhaps the best is Keith Jackson, who far from being a fish out of water, led Dolphin receivers in receptions. And this guy's playing my outside. I just want to stick him in that Z over there. Ain't nobody over there, so Kessel's coming out of the hole back there. Kessel's coming out of the hole back there. He's cheating up and coming out of the hole. And see, that safety stand on the hash over here, because he's in there. The Dolphins are committed to getting the ball to Jackson more often next season. But consistently having a tight end in pass patterns puts a premium on pass protection. To that end, the Dolphins acquired Ron Heller from the Eagles. Heller was widely regarded as the anchor of the Eagles line. And next season, he'll not only be expected to give Marino more protection, but help a suspect running attack. Ironically, Bobby Humphrey was a more valuable receiver than runner as he actually led the Dolphins in receptions last year while Tony Page made the most of his rare running opportunities. Miami's running game, however, rests in the hands, or rather feet, of Mark Higgs. And if Higgs is a relatively obscure number one back, it's a quality he uses to his advantage. Higgs' ability to not only follow his blockers, but actually hide behind them, makes him a genuine threat near the end zone. Still, Miami's offensive fortunes remain inextricably linked to Dan Marino. Last season, Marino was the only quarterback to pass for over 4,000 yards. And while the Dolphins may score slightly more frequently on the ground than they used to, they still move the ball best through the air. And most of the Dolphins' offseason moves were dedicated to improving the passing game. Former Patriot Irving Fryer has always had a knack for the spectacular. Acquiring Fryer, who like Marino was hardly a fresh face, suggests that the Dolphins are serious about taking the next step toward a Super Bowl and taking it quickly. That is not to say the Dolphins don't also have an eye for the future as well. Mark Ingram, another off-season signing, is still in his prime. But while the offense will have some new faces next season, it might be the defense's new attitude which makes the biggest difference. For years, they didn't have a defense to back up him and Clayton and Duper. Now it seems like they do have a defense that's coming along that has some pride in itself for what it can do, not just for what the offense can, how the offense can set it up. Last season, the Dolphins' defense ranked fifth in the AFC, which is a marked improvement from a year ago. But even more encouraging for Miami fans is the remarkable speed with which Miami has improved. Troy Vincent led the team in passes defense as a rookie, while Brian Cox gives the Dolphins a legitimate linebacking terror. 
In just his second year, Cox was named a Pro Bowl starter. His ability to punish passers makes him valuable. His ability to inspire makes him essential. Rookie Marco Coleman proved a quick study by finishing second on the team in sacks while being named NFL Rookie of the Year as the Dolphin defense finally found an identity of its own. And the only thing they like better than hitting each other is hitting opponents. If Miami can make as many big plays in 1993 as they did a year ago, the Dolphins will take the next step, and the fans will be cheering all the way to Super Bowl 28. It's a tall order, but at long last, Miami may have found the ticket. If the Dolphins do get back to the Super Bowl, it's likely to be on the arm of Dan Marino. But 20 years ago, the Dolphins went to their third consecutive Super Bowl, not on the arm of a quarterback, but on the acumen of a head coach and a headstrong fullback. Of course, Don Shula is still in Miami, and sometime next season, he'll become the NFL's all-time winningest coach. But before we review Shula's greatest season, we're going to celebrate the extraordinary running of Larry Zonka. As a runner, Zonka had all the subtlety of a tractor trailer coming at you on the wrong lane. But if he lacked moves, he never lacked motivation. And he never met a collision he didn't like. The Thunder in the great Miami Dolphins teams of the early 1970s was number 39. Fullback Larry Zonka. When all else fails, and it's obvious that it's going to come down to a direct physical confrontation, I always thought it reflected a, a higher degree of intelligence to do the inflicting first. out into the open field where it was a man in the secondary, obviously I'd have an extreme size and weight advantage. Uh, generally, they were looking for a side shot rather than a head-on shot, simply because of the, the ratio of size, weight, and so on. But very often, if you would cut back directly into them, that element of surprise would completely discombobulate whatever they were trying to put together. And you'd be able to not only avoid the tackle, but lay in some devastating blows. I liked that style. I won't hide that. I, uh, I preferred to run inside. My playing weight went from 235 in, in the early 70s to 250 or 255 in the latter part of the 70s because I was running inside. And it was kind of fun to meet head on. When I won, it was very rewarding. I didn't like it when I lost that battle. Zonka's lost confrontations were often as breathtaking as the many battles that he won. Drafted first by Miami in 1968, it wasn't until 1970 and the arrival of new head coach Don Shula that this down and dirty runner began leaving his impact on the NFL. Shula quickly found ways to exploit the Zonk's speed and quickness, both of which were uncommon in a runner so large. And not since the days of Bronco Nagurski had the NFL experienced a runner with such punishing, tackle-breaking power. Even if you had an open shot to get him, to hit him as hard as you could hit him, I always had the sense that I got the worst of the deal. I can remember some shots that I took on him one-on-one, -on -one, and, you know, I couldn't bring him down. You know, you need help. It's like trying to catch a runaway truck on in time when you see a bus 
and you put it on the side of a hill, and uh, you didn't put your emergency brake on it, and it starts to roll. We you know you're trying to grab it, <laughs> and there's no way. Larry Zonka was a defensive back's worst nightmare, but he was a coach's dream. As a football coach, it's, it's tough to get attached to somebody uh, on a personal basis, but uh, it's tough not to get attached to a guy like Larry Zonka. To know him is to love him, a guy with a great sense of humor, and on game day, uh, one of the toughest football players that I've ever been around. I think Larry had 12 or 13 broken noses over his career, and uh, from week, week to week, it was, uh, you had to guess which side uh, of his face his nose would be lying on. I don't know why you bring my nose up. Is there something wrong with my nose? <laughs> he liked a little bit of blood dripping off his nose. He liked to look down and see himself filthy, dirty, because he now knows that he's playing the game. He's into it the, the way that he likes to be. And the, uh, the bigger the game, the better this guy played. In 1971, Larry Zonka personally carried the Dolphins to victory in the longest game in NFL history. One year later, Zonka's unrelenting power propelled the Dolphins to a victory over the Redskins in Super Bowl VII and a perfect 17-0 season. In 1973, Zonka capped off the Dolphins' second straight world championship by earning most valuable player honors for Super Bowl VIII. Throughout his career, Zonk played fullback like a horse plows a field, doggedly with a high pain threshold and with great determination. But I took a lot of pride in being a power running back. I think had I not had that little bit of speed and body control or whatever it was, that I would have probably ended up a middle linebacker. I know Dick Butkus and he kids me about that on occasion. Uh, I don't see him too often anymore, but 10 years ago, back before he became a famous movie star, we. I managed to see him once in a while. It was interesting, back then people called him Zonka. Now people ask me if I'm Butkus. <laughs> that bothers me. <laughs> Larry Zonka, Dick Butkus, and the rest can be compared to each other, but few others. Every time these men stepped onto a football field, it was crunch time. The assistants may draw up the plays, but the head coach makes the critical decisions that shaped a season, and no coach ever made a season's worth of decisions any better than Don Shula did in 1972. The first turning point came in week three in Minnesota. The Dolphins tried to outfinesse the Purple People Eaters, but found themselves behind 14 to six and hurting. Unable to run for a touchdown, Shula decided to keep a touchdown first. Coach Shula, Calls for field goal. It would have been a 51-yard field goal. I said, I've never kicked anything over 47 yards. This guy must have a lot of confidence in me. So I went in and hit the ball, and fortunately, that ball kept on going in Minnesota. I made the 51-yarder. And then with 28 seconds to go, Bob Greasy is trapped. He looks left and right in the last second. He throws the ball to Jim Mandich in the end zone. We win the ball game 16-14, which kept that winning streak alive. At 3-0, the Dolphins were steaming along as the league's only undefeated team. But in week five, San Diego's Deacon Jones had a collision with quarterback Bob Greasy and derailed the Dolphins Express. When Bob went down, it just seemed like all of our hopes uh, went down with him. But Don Shula had lost a future Hall of Fame quarterback before. When he had coached the Colts and Johnny Unitas went down, he had made it to the Super Bowl with Earl Morrow the same Earl Morrill he had claimed off waivers before the 72 season. I brought Earl down for insurance purposes, and here was a chance for the insurance policy to pay off, and it paid off uh, handsomely. And Earl got into the huddle, he said, just relax, you guys don't have anything to worry about, we're gonna get it done. And sure enough, he bailed me out down here like he bailed me out when I was the head coach in, in Baltimore. Drop straight back to throw, he sets up, he is firing down in the corner, Warfield, touchdown! Morrill spent most of his time handing off to Mercury Morris and number 39 Larry Zonka, the first teammates to ever rush for a thousand yards in the same season. The Dolphins set an all-time record for rushing yards, but the team's longest touchdown run of the year came from their 38-year-old cast-off QB. It was uh, one of those scrambles. Everybody collapsed and I almost threw the football, stepped out to the left and uh, I just sprinted into the end zone. 
Larry Zonka and uh, uh, Murky say, Earl ran and ran and ran. Those guys kid about it all the time. And they say, well, it's not the longest running yard. It's the longest running time. It went 31 yards, but it took me probably two and a half minutes. Miami ran more than anyone in the league. Shula was simply sticking to what his players did best, but he wasn't afraid of a little razzle-dazzle either, outwitting opponents like future Hall of Fame linebacker Ted Hendricks. Shula made the most of his players' skills, like Paul Warfield's running, or the passing of college quarterback-turned-NFL receiver Marlon Briscoe, who completed three of three for the year. As for Morrill, he became the oldest quarterback to win his conference's passing championship, and he led the Dolphins through an undefeated regular season. But he had also unwittingly led Shula into another crisis. This time, what to do when Greasy came back? Bob Greasy was the acclaimed team leader and a future Hall of Famer. Yet Shula decided to keep him on the bench in favor of the 18-year career backup for the final two regular season games and into the playoffs. In the first round against Cleveland, the offense performed sluggishly deep into the fourth quarter. The Dolphins were facing an upset loss, but Shula stuck with Morrill. Morrill drove the Dolphins to the winning score in the final minutes, but in the AFC Championship game in Pittsburgh, Morrill mustered no sustained drives and only one touchdown. In the third quarter, Shula finally went to Greasy, and once again, his decision turned out for the best. On his first possession in three months, Greasy delivered. The Dolphins came from behind to win and kept their perfect record heading into the Super Bowl. Still, Shula feared the worst. And the toughest uh, night, I think, of my life was the night before the Super Bowl when we're sitting there 16-0, and and I had the realization that if we somehow lose the Super Bowl and go 16-1, and that would be my third Super Bowl loss out of three attempts. The season, in my mind, would have been a failure. The Dolphins were actually a two-point underdog, but Greasy led them over the top. Drop, uh, drop the throw. He sets up. He is firing for... Boy, he's got it! And he's in for the touchdown! For Don Shula, in 1972, every decision worked to perfection. So when choosing the greatest season a coach ever had, that decision should be perfectly clear.